Now, if you listen, people will tell you what they love, right? And I think one of the best ways to get to know someone is to ask them about their favorite TV show. Now, favorite movie is a fun conversation, but most movies are uh, 90 minutes, two hours, that sort of thing. And even if it's a movie you've watched over and over and over, and if I asked you, you could quote it to me in full right now, or you drop it in a conversation where the other person doesn't even know you're quoting the movie or whatever the case may be. Movies are fun, but with TV shows, when you ask somebody what their favorite TV show is, you just get such a richer text. You get much, much more time spent with that show and those characters, and I think what is your favorite TV show often becomes a better window into who we are as people. So here is a brief, I will try to keep brief and not preach the whole sermon on this show, here's a brief window into who I am as a person. My favorite TV show is Lost. Now, it's okay that you didn't break into applause, it hurt my feelings a little. Um, (laughs) When I said it in the staff meeting this week, Kelly just walked in, when I said it in the staff meeting this week that I was going to talk about that this morning, and I said my favorite TV show is Lost, Kelly goes, that old TV show? And it like it crushed me (laughs) deep inside. But it's true. I mean, Lost premiered on ABC 18 years ago next month. It was 2004. I mean, it's like, is, is it just me? When I say 2004 was 18 years ago, that doesn't sound right. And I was not a math major. But 2022 minus 2004 is, in fact, 18. Now, look, I, obviously I'm biased towards this show. I've already told you that. But I would also submit that Lost is not only an incredible show. Uh, it, Lost is one of the more important TV shows, not just of its time, but of any time, because of when it hit on the calendar. Now, if you are somehow were under a rock 18 years ago uh, and are like, I have no idea what this guy is talking about, Lost is a show that begins with a plane crash and is a story of the f- survivors of this plane crash on an island, and both the island itself and the characters end up being really fascinating. Lost came out in 2004, a couple years after shows that maybe are some of your favorites, like The Sopranos, that really raised the bar for what quality could be expected in a TV show that kind of captured the masses. But at that point in time, in 2004, a lot of the TV shows that were doing that were on HBO. HBO was a channel. Remember channels? HBO was a channel. It wasn't HBO Max. It was just HBO, and it was a thing that you could pay to subscribe to, specifically to watch television shows like The Sopranos. But Lost was on ABC, and Lost was free for anybody to watch. But also, Lost, so Lost kind of inherited some of that, everybody's talking about this show and we can expect a higher quality stuff, but Lost also came out in 2004. In 2004, everybody had the internet, but nobody had social media. Facebook came out in 2005, Twitter was a few years after that. So Lost had both the thing, the things that happen when shows today get really, really popular, like Game of Thrones or Yellowstone or Breaking Bad or whatever you watch, especially among dramas. Shows that get really, really popular can carry a whole economy around that show, right? There's not just the show, there's websites about the show, and there's reviews, and there's podcasts, and you can consume all of this material about whatever it is that you're watching. Lost had all of that, but because there was no social media, if you wanted to talk to somebody about that show, you had to, you know, like, sit down in a room with them. (laughs) and look at them in the eye and say, what do you think's in the hatch? Not enough of you have seen this show. This is is so, I'm crushed. You're gonna see it in just a second. So like, some of my favorite memories of watching this show are the show itself, but also sitting down with my friends the week between episodes and trying to figure out what in the world was happening on this show. So in addition to how great it is, Lost also has what I think is one of the best scenes that uses something from the Bible. I'm going to show you in just a second a scene from season two of Lost where two characters are talking about a story from the Bible. John Locke is going to come walking down the hallway and he's going to sit down at a table with a character named Mr. Echo who's going to tell him that he has something for him. And the something he has for him is tied into the mythology of the show. But he uses a story of the Bible, story from the Bible and a story of renewal to set this up. So Take a look. Here's an episode or a clip from season two of Lost. It's a beautifully told story of what I would say is an obscure passage in the Bible. 
And we would say Echo tells it really well, except for one detail when he says, you may know it as the Old Testament. We would say, really, it's, you may know it as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, because the story he's telling is in what we call the Old Testament itself. So they're trying to rebuild the temple, and they come back and they say, we found a book. Now, where we'll pick it up is what happens when they read it? They found the book of the law. They found, for argument's sake, let's say they found Genesis through the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They found the covenant. They found this book. So what happens when they read it? Here's 2 Chronicles 34, starting in verse 19. What happens when they read it? Well, when the king, Josiah, heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. Josiah gave these orders to Hilkiah, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and to Asiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the remnant in Israel and Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Because great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us, because those who have gone before us have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book book. They find a book, but when they read it, Josiah tears his robes. It's cause for lament because when they read, when they read the covenant between God and his people that we've looked at the last couple of weeks, this covenant that was renewed at Mount Sinai and renewed on either side of the promised land, when they read it all of these years later, the people have not been following it. Right? The book was lost. How could they have been following it in a sense? But there is lament because when they read what God expects from God's people, it becomes apparent that they've become disconnected from God's story. So here's what Josiah does. This is a few verses later in verse 29 of 2 Chronicles 34. The king, Josiah, called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, and the Levites. Note again, all the people. This covenant is for everyone. All the people, from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. Follow the Lord, keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and soul to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledged themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah removed all the detestable idols Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites, and he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as Josiah lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So they read the book, they read the covenant in front of all of the people, so now everyone knows the story again. They renew this covenant in the presence of least to greatest in front of everyone. They get reconnected to the story that God is telling. And for Josiah, because he is a good king, part of that renewal, part of renewing the covenant, is tearing down idols. So when we talk about renewal, at some point we have to talk about our idols. Yeah? We have to talk about what our idols are for us as people. And we have to at least ask the question what our idols might be for us as a church, for any church. Now, look, we we can think of idols in lots of different ways, foreign objects, foreign gods, things we worship, things we spend too much time on. I really like the way, this is how Andy Crouch defines it in a book called Playing God. He says, an idol is a cultural artifact that embodies a false claim about the world's ultimate meaning. An idol is a cultural artifact that embodies a false claim about the world's ultimate meaning. Idols are things that advance claims about ultimate reality. And because they are false gods, they end up advancing claims that are ultimately mistaken. But an idol doesn't have to be as obvious as a small golden statue or a golden calf, if you like. And an idol doesn't have to be inherently evil. 
I mean, many of the things that become idols for you and me today, money, technology, grapes that become wine, these things are not inherently evil by themselves, right? An idol doesn't have to be something that is we just look at and are like, obviously that's an idol or obviously that's bad. But when we assign belief to a thing, When we assign belief to something, and particularly when we assign a belief that tells me that the story this thing is telling, the story this thing is telling about me is more true than the story God tells me about me. The story this thing is telling me about the world is more true than the story God is telling me about the world. That's when we run the risk of making our own gods. Look, if you want the most basic example of what an idol is these days, I brought one this morning, and I bet you did too. Yeah? Now again, let me say, it doesn't have to be. This thing is not inherently evil, I don't think, (laughs) right? (laughs) Think of the good we can and do accomplish with this. What can't I know? What can't I Google, anyway, right? What obscure piece of music, almost any piece of music that's ever been recorded in the history of recording music, can't I listen to or watch or stream or download? What classic TV show can't I pull up a three-minute clip of on YouTube and show it to a room full of people? Yeah? It doesn't have to be inherently evil. And here's, here's the thing, too. Like, one question with idolatry Is the story my phone tells me about me and tells me about the world in line with the story Jesus tells me about the world? It's not just, do you use your phone to do bad stuff? Yeah? It's way bigger than questions like, do you use your phone to buy drugs and look at pornography? Do you use your phone to feed an addiction? Though that can certainly be true. There is clearly a connection between idolatry and addiction. And let me say, if you or someone you love is walking through the pain of what we would call misplaced dependency, if you're walking through hurt, we would love to see you on Thursday nights for recovery. As we'll see in this series, recovery and renewal are really good friends. And we're all recovering from something, just as renewal is for everyone. This phone could be used to feed an addiction. This phone could also just be used as a place to hide right? And some of that may bleed into addictions too, or maybe it's just like you don't have to look at anything bad, and you may have a clean internet search history, but oops, there went five hours because I was doing something on my phone. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we felt that, did we? Me too, yeah. It's ironic for me because especially like my greatest phone or Nintendo Switch time is Sunday afternoons after church when I'm like, I'm done. You know what I want? My couch, and you know what feels good? It's right here in my pocket. I'm just going to pull it out and So certainly, idols can do those things. Idols can feed addictions. Idols can distract. But this thing is also dangerous because this device makes it awfully easy to believe that this world is about me more than it is about we. What I look at on here, whether what you look at on here, whether it's your social media feed or whatever news you subscribe to or whatever, is really, really, really tailored just to me. It shows me things that generate response from me. And sometimes what generates response from me is anger and agitation and can you believe this and that sort of stuff. And all that happens with it held about two inches from my face. And then sometimes, even though we have this wondrous box and all that stuff, we also just, I, me too, just like to take it and use it and hold it two inches from our face and take pictures of ourselves with it. That's the God of our own making. And even if you don't use your phone, and this is just one example, but even if you don't use your phone to look at anything bad and you have very good and healthy boundaries about how much screen time you have, it's a story your phone tells you about you, consistent with the story Jesus tells you about you. This is a story your phone or your idol or whatever it may be. It's a story it tells us about the world consistent with the story that Jesus tells us about the world. Because the story Jesus tells from the beginning and more often than anything else is a story of the kingdom of God, right? A place where God's vision for this world might actually take shape. Where God's grace is available to the least and the greatest and especially for the poor in spirit. And the story Jesus tells is that by sharing in his death, We share in his life. 
that we is in fact greater than me. Jesus tells a story of renewal and redemption. Look, I mean, this goes for TV shows can be an idol or a distraction, right? But sometimes when people talk to me about TV shows, like our, our first concern of should we watch it falls in the sex and violence category. And that's fair. But maybe a deeper question to ask is, is the story this show is telling me about the world in line with the story Jesus is telling me about the world? How do these narratives line up? Is it redemptive? Is it, can I find good news in it somewhere? If I ask the people you love, what are your idols? What will they say? The people you spend the most time with. What most tempts you to believe a story about the world, a story about yourself that is different than the story that Jesus is telling about you and about this world? What tempts us to believe that me is in fact greater and more important than we? Because part of renewal is always going to include discussing, approaching, and ultimately tearing down our idols and remembering and retelling the better story that God has for us. And then finally, what are our idols as a church? What tempts us to believe a story about ourselves that is different than the story Jesus is telling about the kingdom? Now look, I've only been here two months. I'm not about to stand up here and be like, behold your idols, pal, church. But also, I got plenty of my own too, yeah? But in closing, I will tell you a story about good news. Uh, one of the best examples I have ever seen of good news being told in a church is a picture we have. That's a bathroom, in case you weren't, I'm sure you didn't mean to tell you that. Um, at our last church, our last church was, uh, the sanctuary was 110 years old. Yeah, mom's up the stairs. Hey, Sophia. At our last church, the sanctuary was 110 years old, and not this bathroom, but the previous bathrooms, I don't know if they were 110 years old, but they were close, and they felt like it. And we had older friends that were having a hard time using those facilities because anyone was having a hard time using those facilities. And we also had younger friends. And I don't know if you know this, but younger friends make diapers. And we wanted to grow and reach new young people, especially because we, were, we had young people ourselves and there was nowhere to change a diaper within 500 yards <laughs> of the sanctuary and do it with any reason or form of comfort. And so we met with our church and had all these conversations, and we said, look, we need handicap accessibility, and we need a changing table. And our trustees met, and we did all this, and they decided that the best and really only place to put it was in the history room. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a church that has a history room, one of these rooms where they have the photos of all the former pastors on the wall, and the picture of the Sunday school class from the 1950s when everyone's in the three-piece suit and there's like eight billion people in Sunday school. And all of that is up on a wall with other artifacts and all that stuff. And the thing is, that story is the opposite of inherently evil, right? That story was good. But over time, it also became tempting to look at that story and believe that our very best days were a long way behind us. And we met and we said, look, this is the, the, we need a bathroom. <laughs> and our, not me, I'm not smart enough, but our trustees think the best place to put it is to put it in the history parlor. And so that's what we did. We tore down two thirds of a history parlor, took pictures off the wall. I remember telling them, if this goes really poorly, you just hang my picture in the bathroom when it's done. <laughs> and anytime someone comes in there, they'll say, that was the guy that did this. But the truth was, the truth is, sometimes it looks different than you think. Sometimes the thing that most reminds us of renewal is a toilet. Because that's what that story needed. Sometimes the things that most remind us of renewal, progress might look different than we think. How do we serve the needs of our community? How do we do these things? It may not always look like you think. It may not always look like I think. But that, that story ended up being the story that most helped us believe in the story that God was telling about us. 
that we was in fact really greater than me. That bathroom ended up being the story that most reminded us of the story that God was and is telling about our lives. For you, what most tempts you to believe a story about this world or a story about yourself that is different than the story that Jesus is telling about you and about this kingdom? Whether it's an addiction or a distraction or just something that it tempts us to believe that the most important thing in this world is me. For us as a church, what tempts us to believe a story about this world and a story about ourselves that is different than the story that God might be telling about us? Because part of renewal will always be the tearing down of our idols and the retelling and reliving of the better story that God has for each of us. Hey, thanks for joining us online. You can find us Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. at 323 West Emory Road in Powell, just off I-75 past the Kroger Marketplace. You can also join us for recovery worship on Thursday nights. To learn more about our church and get connected, visit powellchurch.com. You can find all kinds of information under the I'm New section. And if you'd like to support the mission of Powell Church, we appreciate your generosity. There's information on the screen that helps you get connected through stewardship and your giving. We hope this day has been a good one for you and that the grace of God has made itself known in your life. Have a great week.